in Dublin, fair city, where the girls are so pretty, I first set my eyes on sweet Molly Malone. She pushed her wheelbarrow through the streets, broad and narrow, crying muscles and muscles alive, 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 she was a fishmonger, and no one could blame her, for so was her mother and father before. As they pushed their wheel narrow, streets broad and narrow, grind pebbles and muscles, the life alive, the life alive, the life alive, the life alive. Now it gets sad. And timely. She came down with the favor. Too soon? And no one could save her. And that was the end of sweet Molly Malone. Now her ghost drives her barrel. That's the ghost. Through streets broad and narrow. Excellent. Thank you, Kirk and Camille Lombard, and your merry host of backup singers swinging around. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining the Slow Fish Crew Together webinar series of deep dive discussions about fisheries, fish harvesters, supply chains, and efforts to support community based, responsibly harvested seafood. I'm Collis Stoll, and I'm president of One Fish Foundation. 
a sustainable seafood education nonprofit based in Maine. Produced in collaboration with Slow Fish, Slow Food USA, Slow Food Turtle Island, One Fish Foundation, Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, and Eat with the Ecosystem and Forever Wild Seafood, these webinars evolved from the postponement of Slow Fish 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our mission is to foster thought-provoking, interactive discussion in a safe but collaborative environment. We want you to leave this webinar with a stronger sense of the Slow Fish Network here in the US and abroad, its affiliation with Slow Food and other organizations, and our shared mission to connect more folks from in and around the supply chain. We also want to leave you with a better better understanding of the Blue Commons and how that framework can be the foundation to effect meaningful change. Most importantly, we want to rally around the energy we built as a community and celebrate the fun of Slow Fish as we head towards Slow Fish 2021 next March. We have a packed agenda today. We're fortunate to kick off the event with an, indig an indigenous welcome from Jacqueline Ross, Assistant Director, Undergraduate Admissions at University of California, Davis. She practices the subsistence fish harvesting traditions of her Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok people. She'll be joined by Denisa Livingston, organizer of Dine Community Advocacy Alliance, steering committee member of Slow Food Turtle Island Association, and Slow Food International Indigenous Counselor of the Global North. Next, we'll hear from Slow Food USA Executive Director, Anna Muley, who will discuss the enhanced slow food, slow fish collaboration that has to be a focus of Slow Fish 2020. That collaboration will guide our collective thinking and efforts going forward. Slow Fish resident bard, Kevin Scribner of Forever Wild Seafood, will then grace us with some homegrown Fisher poet verse. Our keynote speaker today is Buck Jones, an enrolled Cayuse member of one of the bands of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. He's also salmon marketing specialist with Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. Next, we'll hear from young seafood harvesters from across North America, including Jordan Kastlunger of California, Jamie O'Connor of Alaska, Kaylin Cedar of British Columbia, and Lucas Raymond of New Hampshire. They'll talk about what they do, why they do it, and some of the challenges they face. Then we'll hear from Talia Young about how the aptly named Fishadelphia Community Supported Fishery has responded to the COVID-19 crisis by making responsibly harvested seafood more available in Philadelphia. We'll then hear from Slow Fish International Coordinator Paula Barbeto and Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance Policy Council, Rosanna Marie Neal. They're going to explain the Blue yeah. Commons concept of treating our, our oceans and waterways as shared resources okay. that must be protected to uplift community-based fisheries and ensure good, clean, and fair food for all. Finally, we'll see a brief recorded video from Congresswoman Shelley Pingree of Maine about the importance of protecting working waterfronts. We'll end the webinar with a short Q&A. If you'd like to, I'd like to ask everybody to yeah. please mute themselves so well, we can yeah. get through this. Thank you. If you'd like to pose a question to one of our panelists, please use the chat button at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as we can. We're exploring some deep topics and there are likely to be lots of questions. So we encourage you to get, continue these conversations on the Slow Fish Listserv after the webinar. Meantime, we know these topics may move you to provide some input today, which is great, chime in. But please remember that part of the safety of this forum means that all comments should be thoughtful and respectful. So I suggest everyone settle in, think fishy thoughts, forget about worrying how long your stash of TP will last and get ready to crew together. And with that, I'll turn it over to Denisa and Jacqueline. Hi everyone, welcome. Yat eh, um, she ate Denise Livingston in the Shia Kitachitni in the Shia, she said in the Abbas's chain, Ose in the Tachitni Dasha Che, Don Nanis Eja Tachitni Dasha Nella, Tay Sedat Nasha, E Telegon Wolia. I just welcome you all in my native tongue in Dene, in the Navajo language, and I hope you can all see my slide here. It says, So glad you're here. 
um, being a part of the programming team. We really wanted to welcome you. And in this time that we're in, we wanted you to just be in a space um, where we could be united and also stand in solidarity and in health solidarity. And in my language, I just told you I was, I am of the Red House People Clan. And in my language, I just told you I'm from this area. You see the rock in front of you. Um, that is a place called Sergon, which is um, a place in Mitten Rock, which is behind the famous ship rock, the Tepedot Rock. Um, that's where I'm from and really wanted to just welcome you from my home. And the pictures that you see there are very meaningful as they are two platters, two plates that I have on my dining room table and welcome you, welcoming you to the space um, and setting the table and acknowledging our plant and animal relatives, acknowledging you and acknowledging and honoring your time and your presence and your participation. And you can see different um, various aspects here on the plate, our seeds, different things happening in this, in this um, image um, on the right side of our sumac and our blue corn, white corn, yellow corn our um, green thread tea, um, juniper berries, all amazing special um, foods there, our pine nuts, and then on the left side, gifts that you've all been giving me, our sister our abalone um, shell there, um, which our sister um, Jacqueline will be talking about, and just the 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 water protection here that's represented um, and the life that's represented here is so meaningful as we come together and um, as you're in your spaces and as you're at my uh, virtual dining room table, I hope you all wash your hands. So in diving into this and um, in hoping that in this time that you are welcome and as we welcome each other as slow food family, relatives, friends, and guests. It is slow food that brings us together in this time. And in the minute that I have with you, it's time for some brain food and some heart food. In our language and from our organization here, we say something in Diné, it's, and many of you have heard me say this many times, is our goal and our motto and our well-being is, is in this um, saying, Shana Daniglinko As Athnel Teto. And that means let's live a long life. And as difficult as it is right now, and even in more difficult in Indian country, as we face things that were pre-COVID-19, we're facing it at a greater impact right now. And so we want to stand together. Let's live a long life. You all say it with me if you can. And I know that may be difficult and it will be difficult to implement, but we have hope. The, the world is in a balance right now. Um, and that's the hope that things remain in a balance. And so in my language, when I introduce myself, yacht, it means everything is well. We're already saying that in advance. And as I give the welcome, we have to remember that our land is our biggest healthcare system. And we will take this time for an indigenous protocol of land acknowledgement. This acknowledgement is meaningful when we connect it with our, our authentic relationships and being intentional and having meaningful informed actions. It is an opening to our greater public consciousness of native sovereignty and our cultural rights, as well as honoring the truth of our narratives of indigenous peoples. It is also showing the respect to our practices and spiritualities that are tied to the land as we continue to develop critical relationships and healing strategies for everyone. So let's pay our respect and honor to the relatives, um, both young and old, our youth and our elders from both past and present, who have stewarded this land throughout generations. Take a moment to connect with the land that you are currently on and truly acknowledge the original people and stewards of the land and the water and the area that you are currently at. And even in this space, even in this digital space, we make that acknowledgement because we are being very intentional about taking the opportunity to be together, to gather together. And although we are um, unable to gather in person, we are still here, especially spiritually. And we are practicing this mindfulness of present, past, and future participation and welcome you into this time. 
in this indigenous protocol. So just take a minute just to arrive and take a minute to reflect. My brother Shane Burnett, who is from our, our, our neighboring tribe here um, from White Mountain, White River, he, in his Apache wisdom, always tells us that silence is movement, that stillness is movement. And that in that silence and in that stillness, this is where we connect. This is where we are given the visions and this is where we are given the solutions. And we have to arrive in that space to be able to capture what has been missing many times in our work, in our presence with one another, in our homes, in our goals. And take that time to reflect And we acknowledge every one of you here. We acknowledge what is going to be shared. We acknowledge the wisdom, the truth, the understanding, the joy, and everything that everyone's going to be sharing. And as I encourage you, um, being an international counselor, be a person of value. Keep your countenance up and remember that faith is a two-edged sword. And we have the decision to choose which sword we're going to choose on which side. Good faith gives us what we need, but bad faith gives us dysfunction and disillusionment and discouragement and all the words with dis. Don't be a carrier of fear and of panic and anxiety. Be a carrier of hope, resilience, and joy. Let's start a pandemic of prayer and of peace and of positivity. Let's remember the stewardship of building community and leading others and serving others and mentoring and building a legacy and investing in future generations. And let's be mindful of the stewardship of caring for our mother earth and our father skies in our best practices and using and reclaiming our ancestral knowledge and wisdom and applications and also embracing storytelling and also being mindful of the ownership and authorship of native narratives. And let's sing songs and let's dance and give thanks. Let's unite and scale in joy and justice, resilience and strategy. Remember that you're the love letter to the future generations. And remember we are the ancestors of our descendants and we should never forget every single morning when we wake up the bag, if it's a medicine bag, the bag that's near you, remember your bag. I learned this from Dr. Dennis Waitley, your bag, B-A-G. B for your blessings, A for your achievements, and G for your goals. So Slow Food Family, no fighting over TP because one of the narratives that we face in indigenous people is the invisibility of it. And in, back in October, I was with one of our comedians, our um, uh, Diné comedians from James and Ernie. And Ernie says that non-indigenous people come to us as indigenous people and, and think that everyone lives in the dwelling of a teepee. And they ask us and they say, do you guys still use teepee? And we come back and says, yes, we still use toilet paper. So in, in that aspect, I really bless everyone with you with some humor, with some joy and some love and sending you our regards here from um, Denetra. Thank you. Oh, good morning, everybody. This is Jacqueline Ross out in beautiful Davis, California, in the traditional homeland of the Wintun peoples um, with their relatives, the Maidu and the Miwok peoples close by. I would like to, to send a special shout out and thank you to Paul and Denise Pouye from the Kausuk Band of the Penacook, Penacook um, Abenaki people who I hope uh, will be on hand to greet us all next year in their homelands out there in beautiful New Hampshire and the East Coast. And um, thank you very much for, for letting us be in your place as well. I'm gonna say a few words of gratitude this morning to kind of set our table for the beautiful discussions that will follow. And I'll be doing this in the Coast Miwok language, uh, Bidea Gabe dialect. 
opuntoi, mananas opu canelo, mamolas suki, mamolas nishwea, mamolas isliwaku, mamolas opu hinero woki, mamolas opu hinero kiwal, mamolas papu yisko, he marco nihinak papi, mamolas pichan, mamolas ma apiko, mamolas iniko, wake hino toi. Oh, so I'm giving thanks for this day that we are all here together in this place, wherever you are. I hope you're thinking of your most beautiful places to fish or harvest, and you're seeing some shots of my homeland up here as well. And we give thanks for the water, these beautiful waters that comprise who we are and our livelihoods in many cases. We give thanks uh, very much for all the teachers and elders um, with a very solemn acknowledgement that um, they are at some risk in cases throughout the world. And we thank that older generation in particular. We also thank the students. We thank all of our teachers, whether that's a teacher you had in school or the salty old dog that kept you from doing something stupid on the, on the water. And we thank you for each other. We thank you for all the elements, the fire, the water, the earth, the winds, and I wish that all your winds blow steady and good for you and get you to wherever you need to go. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Wally Kamolish. Over to you, Kalish. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline and Denisa, for beautifully setting the tone for this discussion. Next, we'll hear from Anna. Uh, Anna, can you please share some of the cool collaboration that we've started, certainly in the past several months, between Slow Food and Slow Fish and what some of the possibilities are? Yeah, thanks, Carlos. It's nice to see everyone here. Um, Anna Mule, I'm the Executive Director of Slow Food USA, based now in my home in Brooklyn, but we have a, a pretty remote team in the U.S. Um, Carlos, Brett, and Michelle came to Brooklyn last summer, I think it was August, um, to have a kind of kickoff brainstorm about this meeting and how we could work together. And it's been a really amazing experience working with all of you and just seeing how the grassroots network of Slow Fish has really come together in this event. So I'm excited for next year to meet in person, but happy we can keep working together. Um, you know, my vision for Slow Food USA is to really listen intently to the network, to take our cues from the network and we're a grassroots movement and to connect people under good, clean and fair food for all. Um, so I think as we move forward to continue collaborating together and to figure out how we can Activate our network as Slow Food USA is a really exciting concept. Uh, there are 150 local chapters throughout the United States, plus active chapters in 160 countries worldwide. So there is breadth and depth to the Slow Food Network. And you know, leaders are really eager to learn more about Slow Fish and to collaborate with fishing families in their locations. Uh, I've been working with Allison McGill from Slow Food Seacoast in New Hampshire and Mara Welton, Slow Food Vermont. They've been working really hard on this event and really excited to make more connections between Slow Fish and the local Slow Food Chapter Network. Um, and next year, you'll see that this Slow Fish event is paired with a regional gathering of Slow Food leaders from the Northeast. So I'm excited to continue those conversations and see how we can work together. So yes, Slow Fish as an event, we're excited to collaborate with you and work together. But also, you know, throughout the year, whether it's these webinars or other activities where we can incorporate Slow Fish concepts and people and communities into the Slow Food Chapter Network, really eager to see how we can strengthen those collaborations. Um, Slow Food is an umbrella organization. You know, we have a lot of farmers in our network, but also chefs. We have policy advocates. We have youth and farmers and educators. And you know, during these COVID times, we have launched a Slow Food Live sessions. You'll see that. So you'll see some of our people coming up in this uh, webinar series. And I'll put a link in the chat here to it. But um, it's basically a skill share. So if someone you know, our chef from Italy can do a how to make pizza at home, or we could have um, demonstrations about planting seeds in your garden. So I'd love to invite you all to join us in that as well as a continuation. And so you can get to know the Slow Food Network um, as well. So thank you, Carlos. Uh, back to you. 
All right, thanks, Anna. As we've said all along, growing the network and aligning with those with shared values strengthens the Slopish network. So, and now our resident Prince of Pros, Kevin Scribner, will sprinkle some Fisher Poet magic on our gathering. Thanks, Collis, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, this last February, I joined over 100 readers, women and men, at the annual Fisher Poets Gathering in Astoria, Oregon. And here are two poems I read there. The first one is entitled, Will the Bottom Drop Out? Three decades before Apple Siri, we wondered if fathometers would ever speak, maybe with a siren's voice. No, not like the honey-voiced vicious ones who lured Greek sailors into shipwrecking rocks. No, no, she'd be gently sweet. Please, gentlemen, take note. It's getting shallow. Oh my, the bottom is getting closer. Now, gents, gents, take care. You're getting much, much too close. And all is business when the waves become trampolines. Keep bow straight into water swelling before you. Just enough forward movement for steerage, but don't rush into a sandbar where the water's dropped out. Just enough juice there to not slip to the side, a wash in the trough. And take a nanosecond of breath to bow low to the deep danger at your side in honor of the millennia of fisher folk before you. Up at the foredeck steering station, there's no hearing the cabin set skipper, radio connected to the boat ahead. Me, at the wheel and rain gear, merely rain gear, survival suit stowed, oh, how bloody frickin' convenient, back there in the stern cabin beneath the bunks. Is this some sort of silly joke? A night trauma of storm swells rising higher and then bumped even higher by everywhere shallows? Sirens, are you there? Siri, Siri, which way do we frickin' go now? Sandbars everywhere, the fathometer useless, the bottom is all about. We rely on the telemetry, telemetry in our buddy's boat, which charts in our own minds softly screaming, focused on scheming a way ahead. Keep bow into waves, don't plow into a bar with no water, into sandbars too shiftless to claim a name or a spot on a chart. Remember always, Take a deep breath and bow low to danger. We made it, check. Seems another one of our nine lives used, gone. We'll laugh when tied up tonight and then back home, we'll reset the tally on just how many more lives we each have left to lose. So th thank you. And one more a Valentine's poem, and it just seems right that Fisher Poets is in February, the month of Valentine's Day, for it is a love fest for all things fishing. This poem's entitled, A Sea of Love on Alaska Airwaves. The brist, hang on. Okay, the Bristol Bay Messenger Service, FN Public Radio, where teenage interns read streams of love letters out to, into the Alaska bush, bereft of phones, satellite dishes, and even timely mail to pillow sweet intimacy into privacy. I love and miss you. Nothing to hide when we're in love, my dear. An alchemy of affection arcs into these words made public, raising the ante on the simple. I love and miss you. Now into a hum among many ears over airwaves. Hungry hearts nodding in their own size of reveries with memories, saddled in bunks throughout the fleet. For millennia, did mariners bundle love in pouches tenderly tucked beneath bedrolls? Or in necklaced amulets swinging heart close? Some say being a skipper will save a marriage and make families. With housebound pressures whistled away, gone with the outgoing tide, then joy and foreplay in the pleasures of return with a child or three conceived in time with moon driven coming and going. I love and miss you out around the bay and back. Again, I love and miss you 
a summer season Valentine as public as any crooner plucking heartstrings in the city. What can embarrass a fisherman in love? I love and miss you. Shared out loud, heart proud, with 10,000 souls my witness. I love and miss you. And thank you all. May your sails fill with healthy winds and your days be full of song. Over to you, Collis. All right, thanks, Kevin. That was uh, great. Uh, good to hear those kind of vibes coming from the water. Um, and now we'll hear from Buck Jones. Buck, can you tell us about the work you do representing tribal fish harvesters from your community? Yeah, good morning. Um, my name is Buck Jones and I do work with Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission and I, uh, I'll get into my job a little bit more, but I think I want to lay some context in our, in our tribal fishery. Um, since time immemorial, our tribes along the Columbia Basin have enjoyed and exercised the right to fish in our homelands. Salmon play an important role in the ecosystem of our region, returning nutrients, ocean nutrients to the rivers, streams where they're born, feeding wildlife even the forest with their bodies. We've managed this resource along with other natural resources, which they depended using tradition, traditional wisdom, knowledge passed down for generations. Next slide, please. Salmon was and is our staple of life and the foundation of our spiritual and cultural identity. Intertribal interactions, fishing technologies, and the very religions of the Pacific Northwest tribes were and are all impacted and influenced by salmon. Next slide. The annual salmon return and its celebration by the tribes assure the renewal and continuation of human and all other life. Salmon are indicator species, meaning as water becomes degraded and fish populations decline, so too will the elk, the deer, the roots, and the berries, and the medicines that sustain us. Salmon and, salmon and the rivers they use are part of our sense of place. The Creator put us here when, where the salmon return. We are obliged to remain and protect this place. The first salmon feast is part of our traditional tribal religion of the Columbia Basin, known by various names, including Washa Seven Drums. This religion continues to guide tribal people and connect them with the Creator and the gifts He has given them. It also connects followers to the land and the culture practiced by their ancestors. This ceremony must occur before commercial or subsistence fishing can take place. It is why every fishing season, before every fishing season begins, we have a ceremonial harvest for fishers to catch salmon for use in these ceremonies. The timing of these feasts matches the arrival of the salmon and the return of the salmon. Without salmon returning to our rivers and streams, we would cease as Indian people. Next slide. Historically, we were wealthy because of a flourishing trade economy based on salmon. Salilo Falls was once known as the Wall Street of the West with trade routes with other tribe, from other tribes traveling to fish, trade, barter, and socialize with their ancestors. With the introduction of hydraulic dams this would eventually uh, inundate important fishing places. Salado Falls in 1957 was inundated behind uh, the Dalles Dam. We had to adapt our ways to fishing. Treaties were signed with the Columbia River tribes in 1855. The tribe ceded most of their lands, but reserved the right to fish at usual and accustomed places. Next slide. Over the time, the, uh, the federal and the state governments encroached upon our fishing rights. Uh, this had an impact on our culture, 
um, uh, exaggerated steep decline in salmon numbers returning. Um, with the Celilo Falls being inundated and disappeared behind the waters, the Dallas Dam had a, a real, uh, you know, culturally and a uh, significant decline in our fisheries. So uh, through a variety of court cases and legislative uh, actions uh, that began to reaffirm the treaty fishing rights that the tribes had, um, we developed a uh, the agency I work for here, the uh, uh, Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. It, we joined forces with the four treaty tribes that fish, um, that have the treaty fishing rights, um, to have a unified voice in fighting these battles. It was, a pro it was established to provide coordination, technical assistance for the tribes in the region, national and international, to ensure that our treaty fishing rights and issues resolved in a way that guarantees the continuation and restoration of tribal fisheries into perpetuity. Next slide. This is the, uh, the area that uh, we are, are fishing uh, and our reservations that we uh, represent. I'm a, I'm a Cayuse member in the Umatilla tribe. We also have the Yakima Nation from uh, Washington State, Warm Springs from Oregon, and Nez Perce. Um, our, member, our member tribes um, ceded lands, um, and, but we didn't give up our right to fishing. Um, our uh, combined area that us, uh, is probably 25% of the Columbia Basin that we, uh, that we uh, fish in. Next slide. Um, with the waters being transformed for with the dams, it it, uh, it 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 impacted our river from being a flowing, free flowing river to a kind of big 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 series of long lakes. So we had to uh, change our ways of fishing. So we do have gill net fishing, which you see in the picture, and we also have uh, platform fishing, either dip netting or set netting, on the main stem of the river. And the picture on the left is one of our uh, Yakima tribal members fishing uh, on a platform in one of our tributaries along the Klickitat River. So this, uh, uh, so we've adapted with it, you know, but we've also still still do our traditional ways as uh, like we used to do at Salilo Falls. Next slide. So. Uh, Part of the role of Columbia River Intertribe Fish Commission, as I said, is that it's a technical advisory arm of the tribes. We're an extension of the tribes. Um, we make recommendations. We're at the management table when the between tribes, states, uh, different agencies, when they set seasons, are put uh, together a team to set the seasons. But the tribes individually set their own their own seasons. So each each tribe has their own uh, set season, but we try to coordinate this. Um, in the mid 90s, probably to the late 90s, we uh, our commission, which is made up of members of our each treaty of the treaty tribes, kind of like a board, noticed that the uh, fishing, uh, the salmon that we was getting along the river was uh, was kind of undervalued. Um, there wasn't too many fish buyers, and we uh, and we noticed it would uh, maybe be a dollar, dollar fifty, two dollars a pound for for salmon, and you know it would drop as the seasons went down to twenty five cents a sam a pound, and then you see uh, in the markets it's going for you know fifteen to twenty dollars a pound. So we uh, we had to do some uh, uh, some changing to change the perception of our fish. Next slide. Um, we developed some uh, some quality handling techniques, uh, some uh, icing techniques, how we can handle our fish better, and that that worked from the fishers on, all the way through some of the buyers and stuff. You know, as we've noticed now with uh, you know we used to have uninsulated totes and we uh 
don't have an uninsulated totes. We developed a, a seafood HACCP that we've provided for our fishers. So we probably have about 600 to 800 fishers along the Columbia River. And our, our fishing area is, uh, as I, mo I should have mentioned, is, is between Washington State and Oregon. It's called Zone 6. So we got 150 some miles of river that we are allowed to fish in uh, treaty fishing rights. So, you know, ice is always a big problem uh, in all fisheries. So we try to develop uh, ice and slushing techniques and bleeding techniques. And as I mentioned, we've provided seafood HACCP for all of our fishers. Um, it's just something that we, we had to um, develop and now with some changing laws with the Food Safety Modernization Act, you know, we've, uh, we've tried to adapt with this. This handbook we, uh, that I'm showing right here is a, uh, a handbook that has some quality guides, some sanitation plans, um, proper handling of the fish. Next slide. So uh, ice always being a, a key element of, uh, of, of fisheries, you know, we've, we've worked on that to uh, have their, our fishers, uh, you know, check their nets regularly, do, uh, do slushing and bleeding as soon as possible to keep the quality um, at a premium. Next slide. So we got different ways that our fishers, uh, you know, sell to markets or whatever. This is a picture of a, a direct to the public or uh, over the bank sales that we uh, our fishers go to. Some of them are in uh, farmers markets, uh, uh, roadside stands. One community um, allows us the tribal fishermen to sell in a uh, in an area there. So that has really uh, been a promotion. We also got during our treaty uh, season. Now we're starting to get quite a few buyers that come along the river and set up uh, that are wholesale buyers. But all, you know, some people uh, will sell it that way. So it's really kept the, with the improvement of our quality and handling of our fish, it's really helped our fishers. So that's part of my role is developing these markets and trying to get them into higher end restaurants and um, for, uh, for our fishers. We do also have fishers that um, have their own markets and they'll, they'll take the fish as far as up to Seattle and, and you know, they've been working with different people and they got their own, their own, uh, their own buyers. And, but we have big, uh, whole, whole, wholesale buyers that come in and buy our product. Next slide. So this is one of the, uh, uh, a, a fisher, uh, actually a uh, subcontractor for a seafood company that is a, a tribal fisher uh, family that's developed their own market. So with this tag, um, they're marking each fish. This company actually uh, reduce the number of fishers that they buy from to improve the quality of the fish of, of the of the fish that they are receiving. So with this tag, it has its own individual uh, code and they're actually marketing if it's a, a gill net caught fish or a drift net caught fish and even getting a higher quality for uh, the platform fish that I mentioned previously, because it doesn't have, a, uh, as, this, as this salmon you can see has some gill net marks, but the platform fish is, is kind of like a seine net, you know, you can take it right out and it's live. So that's, uh, is, what they're uh, what they're they have done, and then they actually have uh, developed a market to these two restaurants that they sell to, so the individual tribal fishers have a little biography and it has a story on what they're uh, on on the tribe that they're from and where they fish and uh, and and these restaurants now are starting to ask next slide are starting to ask so like we want fishers you know, Fisher A here, and they'll have a biography and pictures of them at their restaurant, so they really know where the food that is coming from. And this is actually helps with traceability too, you know, with uh, um, anything going wrong with the product or whatever, then they, have a, then they have a record of way, well, we caught this fish here and we know where it came from. 
And so that's really been an improvement. You know, we've, uh, we've got a couple uh, of brick and mortar. Well, we've got one brick and mortar store that's probably owned that has their own uh, fish market on the Columbia River. And uh, we got some others that are trying to be more compliant and uh, regulatory compliant and are kind of like roadside stands and they've developed their own markets. But this, uh, this company here is, uh, is really uh, been successful in keeping the, the quality up, which is the key in, in any fishery and, uh, and their product going into uh, markets. Next slide. So we've been working with uh, with these fishers for numerous years, and as we know, in in fisheries, the uh, the age is getting up there, the fleet or whatever. But in what's something good about the tribal fishery we see is that it's been in our people for so long that you know we're teaching our young ones how to uh, uh, keep this uh, tradition going that that has been in our in our families and our people since time immemorial. It is, uh, it is, um, you know, it's kind of some trying times right now with uh, fish returns and stuff like that. But we think with the, with the, with the markets that are uh, the handling and the, the work that we've done, done to improve the, the quality of the fish that we can sustain. And uh, next slide. And you know, we'll, We'll never get back to the the, the slidal falls like this or whatever, but we will uh, we will keep working with our fish because it's uh, as I mentioned previously, we're not gonna if the salmon don't come back and they don't come back as people, if the salmon don't come back us as tribal people we won't be here and we always want to keep our our fish going and it's uh, it's actually getting that time where we're gonna have these first first ceremony so it's uh um it's one other thing that i forgot to add is that we we do we do boat safety for our fishers as you can see on this fisheries uh on on these platforms somebody fall off there and it, granted it's not like that now but for a while we had some we had some issues with fishers not returning when they went out to fish and that no. that is what we uh do not want so we've improved our Quality handling, uh, quality handling, and our boat safety for our fishers. I can move my camera up. That's what I ha have today. Thank you very much for this time. Well, thank you very much, Buck. Uh, it's great to hear um, the perspective on how to live in harmony with nature as a resource, and certainly adaptation as well. Uh, now I'll turn it over to our young fish harvesters who truly represent the future of community-based fisheries. Jordan cast longer fishes with her dad out of San Diego and spoke at Slow Fish San Francisco in 2018. Jordan, can you tell us about how you and other fish harvesters in the area market your catch? Yes, so I'm gonna kind of introduce myself, talk about how we market um, all of our fish here in San Diego. So like Carl said, I am Jordan. I am a commercial fisherman out of San Diego, California, and I am 23 years old. So I am third generation commercial fisherman. My grandfather over here on the right in the glasses was, uh, he worked as a engineer at Roar. And then when he retired at the ripe age of 60, he commercially fished for the remainder of his life. And then down here, my dad with him in both of these photos started fishing with him when he was very young. 15, 16, bought his own boats and his own permits. And he has been commercially fishing since then. So it's been about 40 years. And I started fishing with him when I was a kid. I just was on the boat doing whatever I could, helping wherever I could, doing whatever, running around, just carrying things. So that's what it meant. And so it quickly became, commercial fishing quickly became one of the big passions in my life and drove me to do a lot of the other things that I am involved here in San Diego. And so one of those is being part of Tuna Harbor Dockside Market. I've been there for six years um, in August. And so it's the biggest way that we direct market our catch to the public and to restaurants. And it was really small in the beginning. We had three, four families that would set up every Saturday. And since then we have grown to about 10 families. So every Saturday from eight to one, rain or shine, we set up on our 
local uh, peer and we sell to the, the public and it's the best way for us to kind of educate them on the species that come out of San Diego because a lot of them show up wanting salmon and trout and a, a lot of things that we don't have because they're not local to San Diego. Our focus is to keep what we sell local and so it's all in local waters. We focus on the seasonal species. We kind of rotate with whatever is in season. Same with the, the families that show up. It's if they don't fish for something then they're not kind of there until their season opens up again. And so it's been the biggest way to connect the public besides selling to restaurants, which also leads into one of the other things that I do. I work at one of the restaurants, Ironside Fish and Oyster, that we supply us and about seven or eight other families supply seafood to. And I'm also part of Slow Food Urban San Diego uh, here in San Diego. I'm one of their two seafood liaisons. And so we kind of work to at the market every once a month, we do seafood Saturdays. We bring in a local chef, um, have them do a breakdown, kind of talk about how people can go home and then do the same thing and replicate what they see, whether it's breaking down the fish or making a similar recipe, because a lot of people like this seafood. They're just not sure where they can find it and what to do with it. And so then with Slow Food, uh, also me and Cynthia, who I co-chair with, this year, we are kind of trying to develop an education plan with younger kids in San Diego. And so this is a couple of weeks ago, I actually went into my first grade teacher was um, her first grade class. We went in and took in a bunch of live stuff and we showed them why it was important to take care of the ocean, the things in the ocean, and just talk about the fishing here in San Diego because a lot of them, yes, they're young, but they don't, they like the, the beach. They're always there and they just don't know what's in the water and what they can do on their end to help prolong the life of the ocean. And so we went in and took in a bunch of stuff and just talked to them about why it's important, took in some lobsters and some crabs and stuff. That's not their biggest project this year with um, Slow Food. <clears throat> and this was kind of a project that they did afterwards to just talk about the things that they learned and they colored in some fish and all the pictures that were put up for the parents to see. And so I think that's the last picture. Yeah. So fishing has always been important to me too, because besides allowing me to spend time with my family, it's also the, the easiest and the biggest way to educate the public on what we do. Again, a lot of them think that it's just a matter of walking into a restaurant and saying, Hey, I want a piece of fish and don't realize that there are people behind the scenes that get the fish to them. And so it's kind of nice to be in the market and in the restaurant and be able to kind of see from start to finish how we do what we do. And then the public consuming it at the end of it. And so it's important for me to, to kind of bridge that gap and again, ed just educate because it's the biggest misconception. People think that there's always fish and we go out some days and we don't catch anything. And some days it's a really good day for us. And it's very, it exci it's like very exciting to see the public's continued support for not only the market, but for all of the fishing in San Diego, where we are now is so much further and advanced than where we were just last year and even the year before and they've always been very supportive of what the market does what the fishermen are doing they are always engaged and wanting to see what comes next because everyone likes the fish and so the highest or the yeah the highest uh or the most biggest challenge that we face here in san diego is definitely being so close to an international border we have a lot of competition with the same species that we fish our fish out of mexico and so we have to set ourselves apart from the fishermen down there and the fish down there and tell people this is why you should support local and support our fish and it's harder to kind of convince people to spend a couple of dollars more but it's not better but because it, it's the same fish but it's different quality because we take care of our fish not that they don't um, and the biggest challenge i think too is being a female in a male dominated industry definitely wasn't easy when i first started fishing with my dad full time and was trying to prove that I could do things <laughs> that all the guys could do but I definitely was able to make a name for myself working in the restaurants working at the market and just continuing to work with slow food so it hasn't been easy but it's I'm excited to see where it goes in the future back to calls all right well thanks Jordan it's a great story you know, what you're doing out in, in San Diego with the Tune Harbor Dockside Market is a fabulous thing uh, we're now going to switch the narrative over just a little bit from fish harvester to fish distributor. Um, we're going to talk with, hear from Talia Young, who is the program director of Fishadelphia, 
a school-based student-coordinated community seafood program in Philadelphia. Talia gave a fabulous presentation at the Local Catch Local Seafood Summit in Portland last October. So Talia, can you give us an idea of how you are responding or how Fishadelphia is responding to the COVID-19 situation? Sure, I can, and we might be interrupted by some small people right here. <laughs> um, so I guess I want to talk a little bit about Fishadelphia um, sort of program structure. Yeah, you could go downstairs and then um, in order to explain sort of how we've been using that structure to respond to COVID-19. Um, so, right, as Carlos was saying, I thank you so much, but I have to talk for about five minutes and then I can take your present, all right? Um, so, right, we are not harvesters, we are distributors. So we run a community supported fishery that is, we call it a community seafood program that is school-based. So we're based at two high schools in Philadelphia and we work with high school students who after school to, to coordinate deliveries from directly from harvesters and docks. And um, then customers pick up at the two schools and then we also send out about a dozen coolers around the city for people to pick up on people's porches. Um, and so, when, I mean, there, there were so many things that were happening in terms of COVID-19, including the schools getting closed. Um, but even before the schools closed, thank you so much. Thank you. Should I hold on to it? Yeah. All right, I'll hold on to it and I'll bring it down when I'm done, okay? It's a, it's a Star Wars toy. Why, thank you. That has Star Wars toys in Thank you so much. Um, um, and so, one of the things we realized is that open it. great. One of the things I realized Mom, is that give me space space. you want some space. Yeah. One of the things we realized is that we have, because of the neighborhood-based distribution. Because of the neighborhood-based distribution that we have, um, we realized we were pretty well situated to coordinate local neighbor-based support, and so we sent an email to everyone. We serve to say if you need local support, if you need grocery delivery, if you need other kinds of support that your neighbors might be able to offer, let us know. And conversely, if you'd be willing to deliver groceries for folks who can't go out, let us know and we can coordinate because we have sort of small community loci all over the city where we can just coordinate people who live near each other. Um, and then the other thing that is true Yeah, I will in just a minute, Lovey. Um, and then in the other thing that's true about Fishadelphia is that we're connecting one of the missions or goals of the organization is to provide seafood for culturally and economically diverse consumers. Um, so high-end foodies and also, and also people who can't necessarily afford the whole foods prices, the higher end prices. And so we offer two price tiers as a result. And so what that means is that we have built a community, what that means is that we've built a community um, of people who, uh, that, that is sort of surprisingly economically diverse. And so the other thing that we did in response is we set up a mutual, no. an aid, a mutual aid fund. No. Yeah, I'm almost done, but we have to talk about what the shelf is doing, okay? Um, and ask people to donate, people whose income and livelihoods were stable to donate. And then, um, and then we've also invited people in the community, including harvesters, including our distributors, including our processors and our student families and customers to let us know if they need financial support. Um, and the thing I was talking with Brett about earlier is that one thing that's sort of true is that there's some irony in telling people, oh, if you need financial help because of COVID-19, we'd like to help you. But if you need financial help because of structural inequity and capitalism, no. then that's harder. And so there, it, it's, it's 
a little bit complicated, but um, but we're trying to leverage the resources and the community that we've built in this very strange moment that we're in. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about Philadelphia as a program and also what we're doing, um, but I, it does seem like somebody else needs some attention. Well, Talia, first of all, I want to say that was the most impressive bit of multitasking I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, also, you know, it, what a great story um, for being able to mobilize so quickly and to bring that co sense of community right through the Philadelphia mission. So I want to congratulate you on that and thank you for sharing your time and your kids with us. Um, I'd like to remind everybody, if you've got questions, please use the chat button because we can, we can funnel them through and we can, we can um, pose them to the panel. I'm not sure how much longer Talia will be able to hang with us, but we'll be able to, to get questions to panelists remotely as well. So thanks again, Talia. Um, now we're going to switch it over to Jamie O'Connor, who fishes out of Bristol Bay, Alaska, which is dear to my heart because I got to spend just a couple of weeks there last summer. Uh, Jamie also works on the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. So Jamie, if you could uh, fill us in with some of the work that you do with the council and some of the fishing that you do and your connection to the water and the resource. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Jamie O'Connor and I fish on Ecuck Beach in Bristol Bay. And I'll share a few photos with you all here in a moment. Once I've got Zoom cooperating. There we go. So this is my family's camp at Ecuck, and we've been fishing there for six generations now. I'm the fifth. And it's just a magical, special place. I grew up about 17 miles north of there in Dillingham, and I'm now based in Homer but we fish sockeye primarily and have been doing so since my great-grandfather showed up in the 30s. I've got to figure out how to advance my slides while also on Zoom. <laughs> there we go. So that is uh, my little brother and I on the front of the four-wheeler and we've been fishing since I think I showed up when I was nine months old. Sean showed up when he was a week old. Um, and we've got about a hundred of us there that are all related and all began with my great grandparents. So you'll see them there on your left. It was an interesting time to be a salmon fisherman in the 90s. I grew up during the price crash and while we maintained our place in the fishery and kept going it was a it was a difficult time prices were down in the 40 cents a pound range we had farmed fish coming on the market and it was before we had managed to do uh, a lot of the work that we've since done in in quality and in highlighting the importance of wild caught seafood which really happy and proud to see those efforts uh, across the nation and across the world. But this is our crew now. We've got my parents and myself and a hired crewman or two hired crewmen. And we've managed to make the transitions uh, through the generations, which have been difficult, but, but beautiful in their own way. And Though I have gotten several haircuts and real jobs throughout my life, mostly I've managed to keep them in the winter and I've never missed a season, which is part of the beauty of working for AMCC. Um, something that's unique about us is we actually don't use boats. We are truck fishermen and we use a pulley system, which is unique to a couple beaches in Bristol Bay and is here in the Kenai area as well. 
but by pulling on that pulley that you just saw, we set the net out into the water using a pulley way out into the water as well. And that's my father and I on some of our old school equipment. We use track vehicles because our beach has gotten more difficult to use due to erosion. We're seeing decades worth of erosion happen in, in years. We used to rely on the Bering Sea ice to come in and protect the beaches from the winter storms. And it doesn't do that very often anymore. So it's changing times for us in that respect as well. Um, but silver lining, I get to learn how to drive a Maruka. So <laughs> we look for our, our silver linings where we can. Moving into some of my winter work, I was hired on with the Alaska Marine Conservation Council about two years ago. And we are a fisherman founded conservation organization working to support thriving coastal communities and, and fishermen. And my work as the Working Waterfronts Director is focused on some of our young and rising fishermen's support and development programs, including the Alaska Fishermen's Network that seeks to connect young fishermen to resources that already exist and each other. And it's been a really meaningful part of my life. We've got an event that I did out in Dillingham surrounding the Alaska Board of Fisheries Bristol Bay Finfish cycle um, in December of 2018. And we connected young fishermen and elders and policymakers and fed them chowder and delicious bread. These are our two cooks. Um, Amy made the bread and it was gorgeous and Susie made the chowder and they were celebrating their their victory there. Um, so this has been an interesting time in my life trying to balance the advocacy and policy side with the, the fishing side. So this was me flying out of ECUC on uh, my cousin's little pacer to get to a big policy meeting in Sitka and then go back to ECUC from the policy meeting. So it's, it's required some logistical, um, logistical feats, but it has been worth it for sure. Part of what we do is help young and rising fishermen learn to advocate for themselves. And the network itself is apolitical, but some of the benefit that we can provide is by taking young fishermen with us when we go to do our advocacy. And this is some AMCC staff, um, Teresa Peterson and myself, two young fishermen, and one of our partners from California out stomp in the halls in support of the Young Fishermen's Development Act, which would, if passed, be the first workforce development program for commercial fishermen at the federal level. So if you uh, know any, any folks in Congress, drop a line for YFDA. Moving back to the fish and our fishery, it's some of our other challenges include uh, political pressure. I know most of you have heard of, of Pebble Mine, and that's been the boogeyman of my entire life, pretty much, and it keeps popping back up. And there are you know, communities of advocates that are working to make our voices and the voices of those who are dependent on the Bristol Bay resource heard. Um, there are some pretty big voices that think that we'll be fine, and I, I don't agree. And so I appreciate all of you out there helping us spread the word and helping to raise the importance and profile of small boat fishermen and what we do and our value to communities. Also, some of our other challenges include fisheries access. Some of the limited participation programs have resulted in a, a graying of the fleet, which I know we're seeing uh, across the world at this point. Um, our average age for commercial fishermen in Alaska is over 50 at this point. 
And so we're seeing huge barriers to access for young and rising fishermen in, in cost, in space in the fishery. I know that um, those looking to buy in are looking at usually a minimum of a half million dollar buy-in, even for a, a salmon fishery that used to be the, the first step into a fishing livelihood. That doesn't even get us into the you know IFQ quota fisheries and some of those federal fisheries, which can be much more expensive. Um, also, you know, in my case, I've got a specialized fishery. All my skills are in being a badass ecuck fisherman, and that includes trucks and pulleys and all the things, but it, it doesn't include how to run a drift boat. So I am, and I think other fishermen who are more specialized are running into space issues. There's just not space for me to throw out a net on ecuck. Um, and so we're we're running into increased uncertainty with climate change and now the things happening in our world right now, um, which are throwing some of our prices that had been increasing up to this point, I think back down quite a bit. So it's an interesting time for young fishermen to, to try and engage, especially given the weather last year was intensely hot which is not good for salmon so we're all watching that and now watching the prices in the markets and and maintaining some hope and some faith that that we will continue on but any support that you can give the young fishermen in your lives would be much appreciated and i will end with our little sixth generation of fishermen this is my little niece ellie and my nephew aiden helping us with a tundra nap. We were supposed to be picking berries and we weren't um, at the end of the season last year. And I'm hoping that this work and our, our continued time in the fishery will help them to be able to maintain it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, uh, particularly for the perspective on the graying of the fleet, which is something that is not just localized anywhere. Um, so it's great to have the voice, your voice, and the other voices that we have here. In fact, uh, next up, we're going to uh, speak with um, Kaylin Cedar of British Columbia. She fishes out of a small community there and serves on the BC Young Fishermen's Network. Uh, Kayla, can you sort of give us an idea of the, uh, the fishery that you're in and what you're doing? Hi everyone out there. Um, I'm Kaylin Cedar. Thanks again for pronouncing my name right and spelling it right in the schedule. Uh, that's much appreciated because it can be a, a tough task. Um, so yeah, I am from Sointula. I apologize, I don't have uh, any slides made up for everyone out there. Jamie, yours were beautiful and I feel inspired to bring some to New Hampshire next year. Um, so I'm from a small fishing community, about halfway up the coast, border to border, um, between Northern Vancouver Island and the mainland. Uh, you can actually see it on this chart back here, albeit not very well. Um, so the island is called Malcolm Island. If anyone has traveled through the inside passage from Washington State up to Alaska, you would have passed probably behind it in Queen Charlotte Strait. So it kind of um, is the border between Queen Charlotte and Johnson Strait, in the Inside Passage. So Sointula on Malcolm Island, where I'm from, um, is a settler community. It was settled by a bunch of socialist Finns in 1901. Um, they were poets and school teachers and they got to um, unceded Kwakwakiwak territory, specifically of the Numbis, in yeah, 1901, and realized that just writing poetry and reading Marx wasn't going to get them very far. So they turned to the oceans and the forests. And um, I am a fifth generation of those settlers who turned to the oceans. So I grew up gillnetting um, with my family I, when I was born, there isn't uh, 
there's no hospital on Malcolm Island. So the next island over, we actually, my parents took my gillnet or my, our family's gillnetter to Alert Bay. Uh, so that was my very first boat ride, was as a two-day-old newborn back to Sointula. Uh, so yeah, I grew up gillnetting salmon and fishing shrimp with my dad and my mom and my sisters. And as I grew up, I diversified into uh, prawns, crab, halibut, rockfish. Um, what else? Probably missing some. Um, the past few years, I have been a student. And that's, well, that's where I am right now. I'm just on the outskirts of Vancouver where I've been attending university. So I'm not in Sointula right now, though I wish I was in Sointula right now with all the wild stuff going on. Um, but here I am in Chilliwack, Stalo Coast Salish territory. Uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. I'm a steering committee member of the BC Young Fishermen's Network. Um, the Young Fishermen's Network was created to uh, respond to a lot of what Jamie said. Um, and Carlos, you mentioned that the gray, graying of the fleet, um, aging of the fleet is not a localized issue. And that's certainly something we're seeing in British Columbia, all over Canada, all, all over fishing communities in Canada. I think we might have Alaska beat. I think our average age of fish harvester in BC is more like 65. So I'm really a young buck in the game. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what the BC Young Fishermen's Network was created to respond to, growing of the fleet, um, focus on community building, education and support for young harvesters, uh, public awareness in the greater community. Um, outside of the Young Fishermen's Network, I've sat on various advisory boards um, for different fisheries. Not currently serving on any advisory boards at right now, uh, right now, as I'm a student and pretty busy, um, being involved kind of in an informal capacity, not through any organization in uh, different policy advocacy around uh, community fisheries in British Columbia and trying to move or kind of force our politicians to create a more community based framework or model for policy on the West Coast. Um, specifically around uh, owner operator policy and fleet separation policy. <sighs> so that's a little bit of what I do um, when I'm not self isolating in my living room. Uh, what else? Um, my partner just bought a prawn boat that we plan to fish together, uh, gooey ducks and prawns. So that was our plan to fish prawns starting in May. And due to all the uncertainty just globally, we don't even know um, if the prawn season will open, if we'll have a market, um, if we'll be able to make boat payments. So I guess within all the uncertainty that we're facing right now, um, it reminds me of the work that we're doing um, on, I guess, the policy level, but also just in our communities and in our economic and political systems in, you know, restructuring these systems to benefit fishing communities and local folks and fish harvesters, not only in times of uncertainty and scarcity, but in good times too, um, to restructure these systems that don't just benefit big corporations or license holders or people that can afford to stay in fisheries, and things get bad. <sighs> yeah, and I guess what I was thinking about uh, before joining the webinar this morning was fishermen are used to uncertainty. You know, we never know if the fish are going to be in the same place. We don't know if they're going to show up at all. We don't know what the weather will be. Usually we know what the tide will be, but you know, we can't change the tide. So I think just fishermen's resiliency and and being part of this community and being invited to speak and, and just listening to everyone else. I want to thank everyone who has spoken. Um, this has been a really, really uplifting experience. And, you know, we're fishermen, we're coastal people, we're 
we can get through this, we can face the uncertainty. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me and thanks to everyone and be well. Thank you, Kaylin. Uh, there's you know great perspective. You know, you talk about fishermen resiliency. Well, the youth part of that is really important, uh, as well as getting involved at different uh, levels of the policy discussion. Next, we're going to hear from Lucas Raymond, who's a gill netter out of Rye, New Hampshire. He cares deeply about promoting opportunities for young fisher harvesters, as everyone else here that we've spoken to. Uh, he also spoke at Slowfish San Francisco in 2018. So Lucas, can you uh, sort of share your story, please? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Lucas Raymond, I'm 28 years old. I'm a commercial fisherman in New Hampshire, as Cole said. I've been fishing for eight years, most of which has been gill netting. Uh, about a year ago, I had to stop fishing. I had recently had a kid and we were fishing almost every day. Um, and no matter how much we seemed to catch, the price just kept dropping. Um, so I wasn't really making enough for the amount of effort we were putting in. Um, I ended up going to work doing carpentry. And I did that for about 10 months. And uh, the opportunity to go lobstering with a guy that I knew from Rye Harbor arose. And I've been doing that ever since until recently with the coronavirus hitting, um, there hasn't really been anywhere to sell the lobsters. The market kind of dried up. Um, they're pretty flooded with lobsters. So I'm currently working at a farm just the last week I've been doing that, um, which makes me think a lot about the importance of what we do. Uh, you know, all the fit, all the food is being sold so rapidly in the grocery stores and in the farms. And uh, for some reason, the fishing industry has been pretty much shut down. It's just crazy to me. Um, but I care about the fishing industry for many reasons, which makes this a very difficult question to answer. But I will do my best to simplify my answer. Um, the fishing industry industry is crucial to people all over the world. We provide an excellent wild source of protein. We are the last of the world's hunters, and I believe right now especially that importance should be noticed. Um, like I just touched upon, the grocery stores have a shortage and can't keep up with the demands, and uh, the farm that I'm working at has just been crazy. We've been getting food from as local of places as we can. I mean, we're still pretty local, but all the farmers are reaching out to every other farmer and uh, the food's just flying off the shelves. And I think commercial fishermen are the only people that are set up to go out and bring back a wild food source that is being provided for us naturally. And uh, we don't have to take the time to plant seeds and wait for it to grow or grow animals. We can just go out and responsibly harvest those fish that are there ready to be harvested. Um, and I think that's, that's a, just like a crucial point to think about right now is just blatantly the need to feed people and our ability to do that. Um, and the difference between that and farming. And, you know, I th it should be a time where fishermen are able to go out and assist the farmers in feeding all the, the people. But instead, basically because of um, the structure of where our fish has to travel around the world and there isn't as much of a local market as I wish there was, that's not really happening. Um, another point that I wanted to make about why I think fishing is so important is just how much time we spend on the water and how we can notice the health of the fish and the water and bring that to people's attention. 
Like I know Jordan said she was teaching at a school about the importance and things like that I think are, are great that we get to do and a lot, not a lot of, you know, no one really sees the things that we do out on the ocean. Um, so that alone is very important to me. Um, the biggest challenge we face in New England and basically through the world is um, the corporate takeover and privatization of the resource with uh, the price of permits reaching ridiculous levels. Uh, it's extremely hard to just enter into any viable fisheries. Um, and also, like I had mentioned earlier, my last year gill netting, uh, the fish prices just kept seem seeming to drop forever. Uh, you know, we were getting paid like 90, 80 cents a pound for pollock and even lower for some other species of fish. And on top of that, having the least cod and losing money on them, it just seems like no matter how hard you work, you can still end up not really getting anywhere. Um, and that in itself is backwards, you know, that supports a big factory far, uh, fishing method. You know, like those boats can land enough fish to make that work for their operation, but any small independent fishing operation is not gonna, not gonna be very profitable with that model. Um, and the, the main thing that gives me hope is just the resilience and determination of fishermen to keep fishing. There always seems to be some way to diversify, to make enough money to get by. Um, I do think, you know, fishermen deserve more than that. We go out, we work hard and bring in an excellent food source for people. And, you know, we sh I, obviously fishing comes with struggle sometimes, but we deserve to be paid a proper price for our fish. And um, the other thing that gives me hope is just the importance of the industry that we feed people. I really hope that people realize that and start to understand the importance of that. So yeah, that's what I have. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Lucas. Um, can you do me a favor? Just sort of stand up a little bit so we can see your t-shirt from San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want. So this is the t-shirt that we got from 2018. And in fact, if you'll notice, most of the panelists, uh, and I've, I've got mine too, most of the panelists, most of the panelists are wearing blue. We're wearing blue in solidarity around the theme of Blue Commons. And Lucas's story, very, being very frank about some of the challenges that young fish harvesters face, that plays directly into the Blue Commons narrative. So first of all, thanks a lot, Lucas, for sharing your story and also sharing sort of the hope somewhere behind it about you know, trying to affect the change that'll matter to young fish harvesters. So with that, I'm gonna switch it over to Paola Barbeto and Rosanna Marie Neal to give us some more perspective around what the Blue Commons is and, and what it means. So Paolo, if you could just sort of set us, start us off with the global perspective of how the Blue Commons narrative took hold, that'd be great. Okay, thank you very much. I will turn off my video and share a presentation with you. That's right, okay. Here we go. Um, before I start talking about the Blue Commons, I would like to make an overview about the context in which Blue Commons emerged. So nearly a decade ago, small scale fisheries organizations took part in the development of the international voluntary guidelines for securing small scale fisheries. And alongside this effort, international organizations, indigenous peoples groups, and small scale farmers 
produced international voluntary guidelines on responsible governance of the Nuarin lands, fisheries, and forests. These two documents, if implemented, could address injustices experienced by fishing and coastal communities worldwide. Both guidelines have been linked to tackling the problems of ocean grabbing and also as a solution to food security and community cohesion. But at the same time, these guidelines were being developed. Many international organizations, development agencies, and powerful conservation NGOs began speaking about the blue growth as a way to apply the green economy vision to coastal and marine ecosystems. So the main challenge of the blue economy consists of moving to a society where we conserve and protect wildlife and natural habitats while also addressing poverty and inequality. The question is, how does Blue Growth plan to achieve these objectives? And here are the proposals. By private investment and government borrowing to finance Blue Growth, by market-based mechanisms for ecosystem services, and by multi-stakeholder consultation to, so that every interest is fully represented. So it may sound good, however, it raises several critical issues. From the environmental uh, side, it is widely recognized that marine ecosystems are being heavily degraded because of the effects of climate change, the resource extraction, the disruption to the food chain, and the rapid ur urbanization of coastal areas. And unless massive changes take place, these ecosystems face an existential threat. On the other, on the other hand, how much the concept of economic growth is still sustainable for the planet we live in? The economic model of the future should reduce natural resource depletion and carbon emissions on the scale that is needed to avoid our ecological crisis. And at the same time, under the blue growth paradigm, climate change is presented as a common threat, a common enemy, but there is no consideration on climate justice. And currently there are some actors who are benefiting from harming the environment, and this, and this is not being recognized. From the social side, it is said that the blue economy will produce more jobs and improve governance. But what about the distribution of wealth and overall inequality? They are not being addressed. And if we take a look to fishing communities around the globe, the number of fishers is declining because of the increasing difficulty of the conditions in which they must operate. And even more, what happens when the state invests more in mining, tourism, rather than in fishing? the most vulnerable members of society lose out. On the other hand, blue economy relies on accelerating economic growth. And this growth is to be achieved by private investment and government borrowing. But private investment is always based on loans and debts to be paid back with interest. And because small scale fishing communities have scarcely any capital to invest, they cannot be expected to repay debts in the long term. Finally, from the political side, the issue of multi-stakeholderism presents several practical problems because what is good for investors is not necessarily what is good for coastal communities. Given the investor-friendly approach, lobbying and conflicts of interest are ignored in the blue economy agenda. And this leads to a substantial deficit on democratic accountability and practical ideas on how to ensure free, prior and informed consent on new investments are largely absent. So the position of small scale fisheries in the blue economy agenda is therefore uncertain. And it will be reasonable to think that under the blue economy, small scale fisheries will be prioritized because the relatively low carbon footprint, the role in providing food security, and because it is a highly labor intensive sector that employs a large number of women. And despite that, small scale fisheries are not particularly investor friendly and do not offer the prospect of economic growth for countries. Taking into account this scenario, Slowfish proposes the Blue Commons to fight against the blue economy model. And here comes the motivations. Oceans and their resources are a common good for all humankind. They are our Blue Commons. Blue Commons is about trying to reestablish the image of natural resources as commonwealth and a sense of belonging to nature. Therefore, something that, that has to be shared rather than privatized or concentrated in few hands. 
useful prescriptions for reforming fisheries and other ocean-based in the industries tend to be highly scientific, focused on profit maximiz maximization, and they are largely apolitical. But if we want to achieve sustainable fisheries, we can only do it in an inclusive and collective way. Slow Fish proposes the Blue Commons to recognize a strong element of collective responsibility in safeguarding the role of oceans as food providers and by opposing the commodification of seafood. If we think about fish as food rather than only as a traded good, it becomes easy to say, to see that there are many fish in the sea and that the overconsumption of a few species is not only harmful for the environment, but also an irrational limitation imposed by the market. In the vision of oceans as food, sustainability in fisheries relies on local production and community relations. Community relations underline the element of social cohesion of the Blue Commons narrative. If we think in the coordination of the different levels from transformation to consumption along the seafood value chain, social cohesion is essential. When the complex food production and consumption systems rely on healthy social relationships, the positive effects that these systems can generate in local communities are huge. Blue Commons also elevate the importance of culture in terms of traditional fishing skills and practical knowledge that fishing communities have and that make fishers stewards of the oceans. Blue, blue, blue Commons reclaim fair governance. Fish resources must be fairly accessible and the access for future generations must be guaranteed rather than prioritizing the profits of a few private interests in short term. Finally, I would like to say that Blue Commons embrace the interdependence. Fisheries are just one piece of a complex food system, all parts of which are affected by shared issues of ecological degradation and social injustice. The industrial logic tends to divide and specialize, forgetting how fundamentally connected and linked everything is. There are no long-term solutions to our complex problems without considering interconnections at all levels. What happens on land has extreme consequences on the oceans. The Blue Commons aim to bridge the huge gap in our understanding of the links and parallels between terrestrial and marine ecosystems. I will stop here. I just want to say that it is clear that the concept of Blue Commons needs to be elaborated and discussed in more detail with the whole Slow Fish Network. And what is even more important, tangible ideas for action. So it would be great if we could use the momentum this webinar has created to think on ideas for action along the year. So I stop here. I I pass the, the microphone <laughs> to Coles. Stop sharing. Yeah. Hi everybody. I'll take over from here. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, for sharing your knowledge on the Blue Commons from Italy. Um, my name is Rosanna and um, I work as policy counsel at NAMA. I'm originally from Jamaica. I grew up there um, and moved here after high school. And um, what drew me to this work is my love for human rights and um, <clears throat> the you know background that I have um in in pursuing human rights and and working on behalf of human rights and then combining that with my love for the ocean which runs deep you know considering that i am from an island that is surrounded by water so um let me uh start my slideshow and get into this quickly because we we've got to make this short and sweet Right. Okay. Um, all right. I'm not sure if that worked. So let me just um, backtrack a little bit here. Got to make sure I press the share button first. And then All right. Um, can you guys see that? Hope so. All right, so the Blue Commons. 
<clears throat> I want to talk about three trends really quickly um, that we have to combat um, in this, you know, fight to protect the blue comments. And one, one is um, a financial trend, and that is to privatize fisheries access, which Lucas talked about. Another, the second is, uh, it's a physical trend of enclosing the ocean and treating it as private property. And the third is a psychological trend um, to brainwash people into, you know, believing the, you know, ideas like blue growth and, and, um, and, you know, the idea of maintaining business as usual and expansion of industrialization while also um, protecting natural resources. So let's just start with um, privatizing fisheries access. Um, the justification for that is um, this false belief that when uh, people have private ownership over a resource, they're more likely to take care of it. Now, we know that's false um, because, uh, you know, for millennia, indigenous people have been uh, living and, you know, with nature and in nature and protecting it without privatizing it. Um, and, uh, and so privatization is, is a feature of modern civilization, which is, you know, clearly causing a lot of damage to, to the planet. So um, that association is clearly false. Um, and uh, so they've used that justification to create the catch share system and, and that has, you know, resulted in corporate control of fisheries access. Um, and without getting into all the details of the Codfather story, but, um, you know, a Portuguese fisherman in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, you know, started from the bottom and, um, you know, gradually grew his business and took advantage of catch share policy until he dominated, you know, the entire ground fish fishery in, in New England. And he was able to just accumulate catch shares um, and create a vertically integrated business that included processing facilities and distribution um, facilities and, and fishing boats. Um, and now and other organizations brought attention to, you know, the fact that he was um, committing fraud. And so he was caught and, um, and recently, you know, there, you know, he's now in prison and um, there was a civil action um, <clears throat> that uh, resulted in the sale of his fishing assets. But really he got, he ended up getting a very, very sweet deal with Noah, where he was basically able to sell his, um, his assets for, you know, the, to the highest bidder. And um, one of the companies that we warned about, a company called Blue Harvest, that's backed by Wall Street, is, you know, was able to snatch up um, a, a large sum of assets from him. Um, and so now they are the, the dominant player in uh, New England. And this is, you know, devastating for independent fishermen, um, you know, who, like Lucas said, you know, have a hard time just breaking even. They have to, you know, they have high overhead. And on top of that, they have to pay to rent fishing quota from, you know, big companies and other investors. Um, all right. Now, the other trend is physical enclosures. Um, and you know, that, that takes the form of offshore aquaculture, offshore drilling, offshore wind, and deep sea mining. Um, I have worked more in the space of offshore aquaculture um, with partners in uh, the Don't Cater Ocean Coalition. And um, we've been pretty successful so far at keeping these, you know, offshore fish farms out of the ocean. But in the U.S., there's a heavy, heavy um, lobby that is pushing for that. Um, but people are coming together, you know, most recently in Florida, um, we got the community involved in, in fighting against a, a pilot project that is an offshore fish farm off of the coast of Sarasota and people came out in large numbers and they were not having it. Um, as I saw it for what it is, you know, privatizing the ocean at everyone else's expense. Then I'll talk about the 
the psychological trend, which is to capitalize on the ecological crisis. And, um, you know, this whole idea of blue growth, you know, is, is pushed by a marketing machine and it's an oxymoron um, because you can't continue to grow and expand the, you know, industrial development and also um, expect to protect the planet. Um, and so when these, you know, corporate solutions are presented um, to climate change, um, if when they're challenged, then often the question that is posed is, well, should we do nothing? You know, as if those are the only two choices, you know, is to scale up on, on industrial development um, just under a different name, blue or green, um, or do nothing. Um, and I think there's some important lessons that we can learn from the coronavirus pandemic, which is that actually doing less is way more effective than, um, than the corporate solutions that have been pushed. Meaning now we're forced, we're all forced to do less. And all of a sudden you have less carbon emissions. You have uh, wildlife that are coming out of hiding. Um, and the planet, you know, seems to be <clears throat> moving in the direction of healing um, just in, you know, a short space of time. And so, um, so rather than be pushing for, for more um, technology and industrial development, um, I think, you know, we should uh, reduce that and reduce our impacts. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and uh, realize that, you know, if, if we want to reduce our impact, then technology is not necessarily the, the only way or the best way. And certainly taking over the ocean and building infrastructure in, in, in the ocean will have damaging effects. Um, so last, I'll say um, that, um, that, you know, the Don't Co Cage Our Ocean Coalition has like come together and you know we have um, we have fought against you know industrial aquaculture. We're fighting to protect the blue commons, and I think we have to use the the narrative you know and channel our love for the ocean into protecting the ocean from privatization and industrialization, um, and demand policies that strengthen the rights of fishing communities, and and keep all of that um, industrial infrastructure um, out of the ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosanna and Paola. Uh, so the Blue, Blue Commons is, is certainly a cool way of looking at our relationship to oceans and public waterways and the environment and how we manage that and our, uh, our resources and uplifting you know, the community-based fisheries that, that Rosanna was talking about. That relationship doesn't just focus on the water though, but it, it also on the waterfront. So we're now gonna see a brief message from Congress of, Congresswoman Shelley Pingree of Maine, who sponsored legislation in support of working waterfronts. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. Welcome to the Slow Fish Conference. I wish I could be with you today as you celebrate the strength of fishermen here in the heart of New England. Our oceans are among the world's most precious resources. As someone who lives on an island off Maine's shore, it's important to recognize all that our ocean provides in Maine, jobs, food, and something beautiful to behold. But our oceans are extremely vulnerable right now. During these times of environmental and economic change, we have to protect our oceans and resist activities that jeopardize our pristine waters. There isn't just one solution to protecting our oceans and fishermen, there are many. For a few years now, I've introduced the Keep America's Waterfronts Working Act, which passed the House last December with bipartisan support. This bill would create a working waterfront task force at the Department of Commerce. That way, we could identify and prioritize critical needs for working waterfronts, especially as we face a climate crisis 
and increase trade threats. Ocean acidification is another pernicious threat to the future of fishing. In June, my bipartisan bill to support coastal communities dealing with climate change and ocean acidification unanimously passed the House. That shows it's not controversial to study the changes happening to our oceans. In order to take action, we have to understand what we're dealing with. The Coastal Communities Ocean Acidification Act ensures that state and federal officials and local coastal communities can better prepare for these changes. The bill helps to fund research on ocean acidity and will empower those who work with the sea. In my district, the Gulf of Maine serves as an important natural resource, economic engine, and tourist attraction across the state. But as we speak, the Gulf of Maine is at huge risk. It is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. As you can imagine, this has put immense pressure on our fishing and lobster industries. To protect the future of our pristine waters and marine life, we must preserve the health of the ocean so it can continue to be a resource for us all. 30,000 Mainers make their living from marine-related industries. They stand beside millions of others across the globe who are at risk of losing their livelihoods if we don't act. Luckily, a lot of Maine fishermen are acting on their own. Many conservation efforts in Maine have been led by our fishermen. A few years ago, they led an effort to have dumpsters available on every wharf and public dock so there was less trash in the ocean. And lobstermen and fishermen are collecting ocean data to help researchers collect the information needed to improve our climate change response. Maine's marine industry drives innovation across our state. Our tourism sector is led by our leg legendary lobster industry and access to pristine waters. Maine's burgeoning food scene is supported in large part because of access to freshly caught fish. As a result, we're helping drive a climate change response across the world. We've led research on how, to, on how kelp can help fight climate change by reducing cattle emissions. We've led the search for ways to make our fisheries more sustainable. Take, for instance, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. They've developed a responsibly harvested brand to assure customers the fish they're buying is a product they can feel good about. Across the state, Mainers are asking for responsible fisheries that protect the Gulf of Maine and those who work in the fish and lobster industries. One of the strengths of the slow food movement is an increased awareness of what's behind the food we're served. Why shouldn't that be same, the same with our fish? Just like people are asking what on-farm and practicing processes brought the steak on their plates, we should be asking if our fish were caught by people who care about the health of the species and the water. Our fish should be helping protect the planet rather than eroding its resources. I'm proud of the work you are all doing at Slow Fish to prevent our oceans and fisheries from exploitation, overfishing, climate change, and development. I thank you for being my partner in protecting our oceans and fisheries for generations to come. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you to Congresswoman Shelley Pingree, although she can't hear us, at least it's good for us to hear someone in her position to be endorsing and promoting a lot of the values that we're talking about in terms of taking care of the resource um, and supporting uh, local fishermen. So it's great that we were able to connect with her staff and get that message and share that with you all. Uh, as I said up front, this was a packed agenda. And so we didn't really leave a lot of time for Q&A, although we got some really good questions, a lot of which sort of formed around the idea of, of what Talia was talking about, resilience. H how do we adapt in these conditions? How do we find responsibly sourced seafood? And how can we make it available to people in, in, in a condition, a situation right now where normal supply channels, as Talia said, aren't working? So, we're going to explore those questions more in the next webinar, which we'll be doing next month. 
We'll update you on the information around that. Um, when we have the website, uh, we'll set it up on the Slow Fish website and we'll do it through our listservs. We'll do it on Facebook. Also want to point people to the Local Catch Network, localcatch.org. Uh, that's a very good repository for information for finding locally sourced seafood um, in a lot of places like community supported fisheries like Fishadelphia. So go to localcatch.org and there's plenty of information there. Um, we'll also make all of our slide decks available because there's a lot of great information there. So we want to make that so that you can access that. Uh, also want to encourage everybody to, you know, keep the conversation going. Um, I, want, I want to thank everyone for joining this conversation. I mean, it, this, it, talk about a tribute to the Slow Fish Network that we really returned uh, our general um, energy from building the, the conference into this. Um, let's view it as a launching point for further discussion and more collaboration and hell, more action. We'll soon post a recording of this webinar on the Slow Fish website. We encourage you to continue the conversation. If you'd like to reach out to any panelist, if they uh, put their email address up in the chat function, check it out there. Or if not, uh, you can email slowfish at slowfoodusa.org. Or if you'd like to broach questions for the broader community, feel free to post them to the Slowfish and or local catch list serves. Our next webinar will be in April, as I mentioned, and we'll talk about COVID-19 resili uh, COVID resilience. We'll talk to fish harvesters, chefs, and others about what they're doing to bring responsibly harvested seafood to their communities while the virus continues to disrupt normal distribution channels. We'll share details, including the exact date on the Slowfish website. I wanna thank all of our guests today. They've all been special. Uh, Jacqueline Ross, Denisa Livingston, Anna Muley, Kevin Scribner, Buck Jones, Jordan Kastlunger, Jamie O'Connor, Kaylin Cedar, Lucas Raymond, Talia Young, Paula Barbeto, and Rosanna Marie Neal. And again, I'd like to thank Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. And we should definitely thank Camilla and Kurt Lombard and their backup singers for the opening serenade. And finally, I'd like to thank the amazing team of 50 plus dedicated and good spirited slow fish and slow food folks that worked tirelessly for months on hours on end to plan a phenomenal event. The good news is that we've already done the great work to ensure slow fish 2021 will be successful. To that end, it's not too early to register. I'd like to especially thank the team that also jumped in to help plan this webinar series, even as we were still reeling from having to postpone the conference last week. These team members include Amy Grondon, fish harvester and co-owner of Duna Fisheries, based out of Washington State in Alaska, Anna Moulet, Brett Tolley, Nas National Program Coordinator with NAMA, Giselle Kennedy Lord, Communications Director for Slow Food USA, Kelly Collins Geyser, Chairwoman of Slow Food San Francisco, Kevin Scribner, Mara Welton, Slow Food Vermont Governor, and Sarah Schaffler, Fisheries Biologist with NOAA. And I'd also very much like to thank One Fish Foundation intern Jennifer Halstead. She's literally been the glue that's held much of our communications organization and definitely part of my sanity together as we planned the conference with this webinar. This webinar has been a co-production of Slow Fish, Slow Food USA, Slow Food Turtle Island, One Fish Foundation, Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, Eating with the Ecosystem, and Forever Wild Seafood. I'm Carla Stoll, president of One Fish Foundation, asking you all to stay safe, wash your hands, keep them away from your face, which is really, really hard, and eat more responsibly sourced seafood, which is a lot easier. As we close, we want to share a music video from Rhode Island fisherman Jason Jarvis, who couldn't join us today. Like so many fish harvesters right now, he's scrambling to make ends meet as many seafood buyers are slowing down or closing up entirely. So we leave you with a video of Jason and his group Green Tea singing When I Look Back. Thanks again for joining us. We'll talk to you next time.